Chapter Thirteen of the Count's Millions by Emile Gaboriau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Thirteen. Few people have any idea of the great number of estates which, in default of heirs to claim them, annually revert to the government. The treasury derives large sums from this source every year and this is easily explained for nowadays family ties are becoming less and less binding brothers cease to meet their children no longer know each other and the members of the second generation are as perfect strangers as though they were not united by a bond of consanguinity the young man whom love of adventure lures to a far-off country and the young girl who marries against her parents wishes soon cease to exist for their relatives no one even inquires what has become of them those who remain at home are afraid to ask whether they are prosperous or unfortunate lest they should be called upon to assist the wanderers forgotten themselves the adventurers in their turn soon forget if fortune smiles upon them they are careful not to inform their relatives poor they have been cast off wealthy they themselves deny their kindred having become rich unaided they find an egotistical satisfaction in spending their money alone in accordance with their own fancies now when a man of this class dies what happens the servants and people around him profit of his loneliness and isolation and the justice of the peace is only summoned to affix the seals after they have removed all the portable property an inventory is taken and after a few formalities as no heirs present themselves the court declares the inheritance to be in abeyance and appoints a trustee this trustee's duties are very simple he manages the property and remits the income to the treasury until a legal judgment declares the estate the property of the country regardless of any heirs who may present themselves in future if i only had a twentieth part of the money that is lost in this way my fortune would be made exclaimed a shrewd man some thirty years ago the person who spoke was antoine Vaudoré. for six months he secretly nursed the idea studying it examining it in all respects weighing its advantages and disadvantages and at last he decided that it was a good one that same year indeed assisted by a little capital which he had obtained no one knew how he created a new strange and untried profession to supply a new demand thus Vaudoré was the first man who made air hunting a profession as will be generally admitted it is not a profession that can be successfully followed by a craven it requires the exercise of unusual shrewdness untiring activity extraordinary energy and courage as well as great tact and varied knowledge the man who would follow it successfully must possess the boldness of a gambler the sang froid of a duellist the keen perceptive powers and patience of a detective and the resources and quick wit of the shrewdest attorney it is easier to decry the profession than to exercise it to begin with the air hunter must be posted up with information respecting unclaimed inheritances and he must have sufficient acquaintance with the legal world to be able to obtain information from the clerks of the different courts notaries and so on when he learns that a man has died without any known heirs his first care is to ascertain the amount of unclaimed property to see if it will pay him to take up the case if he finds that the inheritance is a valuable one he begins operations without delay he must first ascertain the deceased full name and age it is easy to procure this information but it is more difficult to discover the name of the place where the deceased was born his profession what countries he lived in his taste and mode of life in a word everything that constitutes a complete biography however when he has armed himself with the more indispensable facts our agent opens the campaign with extreme prudence for it would be ruinous to awake suspicion it is curious to observe the incomparable address which the agent displays in his efforts to learn the particulars of the deceased's life by consulting his friends his enemies his debtors and all who ever knew him until at last some one is found who says such and such a man why he came from our part of the country i never knew him but i am acquainted with one of his brothers with one of his uncles or with one of his nephews very often years of constant research a large outlay of money and costly and skilful advertising in all the european journals are necessary before this result is reached and it is only when it has been attained that the agent can take time to breathe 
but now the chances are greatly in his favour the worst is over the portion of his task which depended on chance alone is concluded the rest is a matter of skill tact and shrewdness the detective must give place to the crafty lawyer the agent must confer with this heir who has been discovered at the cost of so much time and trouble and induce him to bestow a portion of this prospective wealth on the person who is able to establish his claim there must be an agreement in writing clearly stating what proportion a tenth a third or a half the agent will be entitled to the negotiation is a very delicate and difficult one requiring prodigious presence of mind and an amount of duplicity which would make the most astute diplomatist turn pale with envy occasionally the heir suspects the truth sneers at the proposition and hurries off to claim the whole of the inheritance that belongs to him the agent may then bid his hopes farewell he has worked and spent money for nothing however such a misfortune is of rare occurrence on hearing of the unexpected good fortune that has befallen him the heir is generally unsuspicious and willingly promises to pay the amount demanded of him a contract is drawn up and signed and then but only then does the agent take his client into his confidence you are the relative of such a person are you not yes very well he is dead and you are his heir thank providence and make haste to claim your money as a rule the heir loyally fulfils his obligation but sometimes it happens that when he has obtained undisputed possession of the property he declares that he has been swindled and refuses to fulfil his part of the contract then the case must go to the courts it is true however that the judgment of the tribunals generally recalls the refractory client to a sense of gratitude and humility now our friend m isidore fortuna was a hunter of missing heirs undoubtedly he often engaged in other business which was a trifle less respectable but air hunting was one of the best and most substantial sources of his income so we can readily understand why he so quickly left off lamenting the loss of the forty thousand francs lent to the marquis de valorcy changing his tactics he said to himself that even if he had lost this amount through m de chalus's sudden death it was much less than he might obtain if he succeeded in discovering the unknown heirs to so many millions and he had some reason to hope that he would be able to do so having been employed by m de chalus when the latter was seeking mademoiselle marguerite m fortunat had gained some valuable information respecting his client and the additional particulars which he had obtained from madame ventrasson elated him to such an extent that more than once he exclaimed ah well it is perhaps a blessing in disguise after all still m isidore fortuna slept but little after his stormy interview with the marquis de valorcy a loss of forty thousand francs is not likely to impart a roseate hue to one's dreams and m fortuna prized his money as if it had been the very marrow of his bones by way of consolation he assured himself that he would not merely regain the sum but triple it and yet this encouragement did not entirely restore his peace of mind the gain was only a possibility and the loss was a certainty so he twisted and turned and tossed on his bed as if it had been a hot gridiron exhausting himself in surmises and preparing his mind for the difficulties which he would be obliged to overcome his plan was a simple one but its execution was fraught with difficulties i must discover m de chalus's sister if she is still living i must discover her children if she is dead he said to himself it was easy to say this but how was he to do it how could he hope to find this unfortunate girl who had abandoned her home thirty years previously to fly no one knew where or with whom how was he to gain any idea of the life she had lived or the fate that had befallen her at what point on the social scale and in what country should he begin his investigations these daughters of noble houses who desert the paternal roof in a moment of madness generally die most miserably after a wretched life the girl of the lower classes is armed against misfortune and has been trained for the conflict she can measure and calculate the force of her fall and regulate and control it to a certain extent but the others cannot they have never known privation and hardship and are therefore defenceless and for the very reason that they have been hurled from a great height 
they often fall down into the lowest depths of infamy if morning would only come sighed m isidore fortunat as he tossed restlessly to and fro as soon as morning comes i will set to work but just before daybreak he fell asleep and at nine o'clock he was still slumbering so soundly that madame daudelin his housekeeper had considerable difficulty in waking him your clerks have come she exclaimed shaking him vigorously and two clients are waiting for you in the reception-room he sprang up hastily dressed himself and went into his office it cost him no little effort to receive his visitors that morning but it would have been folly to neglect all his other business for the uncertain chalus affair the first client who entered was a man still young of common even vulgar appearance not being acquainted with m fortunat he deemed it proper to introduce himself without delay my name is le plaindre and i am a coal merchant said he i was recommended to call on you by my friend bousquet who was formerly in the wine trade m fortunat bowed pray be seated was his reply i remember your friend very well if i am not mistaken i gave him some advice with reference to his third failure precisely and it is because i find myself in the same fix as bousquet that i have called on you business is very bad and i have notes to a large amount overdue so that you will be obliged to go into bankruptcy alas i fear so m fortunat already knew what his client desired but it was against his principles to meet these propositions more than half way will you state your case said he the coal merchant blushed it was hard to confess the truth but the effort had to be made this is my case he replied at last among my creditors i have several enemies who will refuse me a release they would like to deprive me of everything i possess and in that case what would become of me is it right that i should be compelled to starve it is a bad outlook it is indeed monsieur and for this reason i desire if possible if i can do so without danger for i am an honest man monsieur i wish to retain a little property secretly of course not for myself by any means but i have a young wife and m fortunat took compassion on the man's embarrassment in short he interrupted you wish to conceal a part of your capital from your creditors on hearing this precise and formal statement of his honourable intentions the coal merchant trembled his feelings of integrity would not have been alarmed by a paraphrasis but this plain speaking shocked him oh monsieur he protested i would rather blow my brains out than defraud my creditors of a single penny that was rightfully theirs what i am doing is for their interest you understand i shall begin business again under my wife's name and if i succeed they shall be paid yes monsieur every sou with interest ah if i had only myself to think of it would be quite different but i have two children two little girls so that very well replied m fortunat i should suggest to you the same expedient as i suggested to your friend bousquet but you must gather a little ready money together before going into bankruptcy i can do that by secretly disposing of a part of my stock so in that case you are saved sell it and put the money beyond your creditor's reach the worthy merchant scratched his ear in evident perplexity excuse me said he i had thought of this plan but it seemed to me dishonourable and also very dangerous how could i explain this decrease in my stock my creditors hate me if they suspected anything they would accuse me of fraud and perhaps throw me into prison and then m fortunat shrugged his shoulders when i give advice he roughly replied i furnish the means of following it without danger listen to me attentively let us suppose for a moment that some time ago you purchased at a very high figure a quantity of stocks and shares which are to-day almost worthless could not this unfortunate investment account for the absence of the sum which you wish to set aside your creditors would be obliged to value these securities not at their present but at their former value evidently but unfortunately i do not possess any such securities you can purchase them 
the coal merchant opened his eyes in astonishment I excuse me he muttered i don't exactly understand you he did not understand in the least but m fortunat enlightened him by opening his safe and displaying an enormous bundle of stocks and shares which had flooded the country a few years previously and ruined a great many poor ignorant fools which were hungering for wealth among them were shares in the tifila mining company the bircham coal mines the greenland fisheries the mutual trust and loan association and so on there had been a time when each of these securities would have fetched five hundred or a thousand francs at the bourse but now they were not worth the paper on which they were printed let us suppose my dear sir resumed m fortunat that you had a drawer full of these securities but the other did not allow him to finish i see he exclaimed i see i can sell my stock and put the proceeds in my pocket with perfect safety there is enough to represent my capital a thousand times over and in a paroxysm of delight he added give me enough of these shares to represent a capital of one hundred and twenty thousand francs and give me some of each kind i should like my creditors to have a variety thereupon m fortunat counted out a pile of these worthless securities as carefully as if he had been handling banknotes and his client at the same time drew out his pocket-book how much do i owe you he inquired three thousand francs the honest merchant bounded from his chair three thousand francs he repeated you must be jesting that trash is not worth a louis i would not even give five francs for it rejoined m fortunat coldly but it is true that i don't desire to purchase these shares in my creditor's interest with you it is quite a different matter this trash as you very justly called it will save you at least a hundred thousand francs i ask only three per cent which is certainly not dear still you know i don't force any one to purchase them and in a terribly significant tone he added you can undoubtedly buy similar securities on better terms but take care you don't arouse your creditor's suspicions by applying elsewhere he would betray me the scoundrel thought the merchant and realizing that he had fallen into a trap here are three thousand francs he sighed but at least my dear sir give me good measure and throw in a few thousand francs more the coal merchant smiled the ghastly smile of a man who sees no way of escape from imposition and has therefore resolved to submit with the best grace possible but m fortunat's gravity did not relax he gave what he had promised neither more nor less in exchange for the bank-notes and even gravely exclaimed see if the amount is correct his client pocketed the shares without counting them but before leaving the room he made his estimable adviser promise to assist him at the decisive moment and help him to prepare one of those clear financial statements which make creditors say this is an honest man who has been extremely unfortunate m fortunat was admirably fitted to render this little service for he devoted such part of his time as was not spent in hunting for missing heirs to difficult liquidations and he had indeed made bankruptcy a specialty in which he was without a rival the business was a remunerative one thanks to the expedient he had revealed to the coal merchant an expedient which is common enough nowadays but of which he might almost be called the inventor it consisted in compelling the person who asked for his advice to purchase worthless shares at whatever price he chose to set upon them and they were forced to submit under penalty of denunciation and exposure the client who followed the coal merchant proved to be a simple creature who had called to ask for some advice respecting a slight difficulty between himself and his landlord m fortunat speedily disposed of him and then opening the door leading into the outer office he called cashier a shabbily dressed man some thirty-five years of age at once entered the private sanctum carrying a money-bag in one hand and a ledger in the other how many debtors were visited yesterday inquired m fortunat two hundred and thirty-seven what was the amount collected eighty-nine francs m isidore fortunat's grimace was expressive of satisfaction not bad said he not at all bad then a singular performance began m fortunat called over the names of his debtors one by one and the cashier answered each name by reading a memorandum written against it on the margin of a list he held such a one 
said the agent and uh, such a one and uh, such whereupon the cashier replied has paid two francs was not at home paid twenty sous would not pay anything how did it happen that m fortunat had so many debtors this question can be easily answered in settling bankrupt's estates it was easy for him to purchase a large number of debts which were considered worthless at a trifling cost and he reaped a bountiful harvest on a field which would have yielded nothing to another person it was not because he was rigorous in his demands he conquered by patience gentleness and politeness but also by unwearying perseverance and tenacity when he decided that a debtor was to pay him a certain sum it was paid he never relaxed his efforts every other day some one was sent to visit the debtor to follow him and harass him he was surrounded by m fortunat's agents they pursued him to his office shop or cafe everywhere continually incessantly and always with the most perfect urbanity at last even the most determined succumbed to escape this frightful persecution they somehow or other found the money to satisfy m fortunat's claim besides victor chupin he had five other agents whose business it was to visit these poor wretches a list was assigned to each man every morning and when evening came he made his report to the cashier who in turn reported to his employer this branch of industry added considerably to the profits of m fortunat's other business and was the third and last string to his bow the report proceeded as usual but it was quite evident that m fortunat's thoughts were elsewhere he paused each moment to listen eagerly for the slightest sound outside for before receiving the coal merchant he had told victor chupin to run to the rue de courcelles and ask m casimir for news of the count de chalus he had done this more than an hour before and victor chupin who was usually so prompt had not yet made his appearance at last however he returned whereupon m fortunat dismissed the cashier and addressed his messenger well he asked he is no longer living they think he died without a will and that the pretty young lady will be turned out of the house this information agreed so perfectly with m fortunat's presentiments that he did not even wince but calmly asked will casimir keep his appointment he told me that he would endeavour to come and i'd wager a hundred to one that he will be there he would travel ten leagues to put something good into his stomach m fortunat's opinion coincided with chupin's very well said he only you were a long time on the road victor that's true monsieur but i had a little matter of my own to attend to a matter of a hundred francs if you please m fortunat knit his brows angrily it's only right to attend to business said he but you think too much of money victor altogether too much you are insatiable the young man proudly lifted his head and with an air of importance replied i have so many responsibilities responsibilities you yes indeed monsieur and why not my poor good mother hasn't been able to work for a year and who would care for her if i didn't certainly not my father the good-for-nothing scamp who squandered all the duc de sermeux's money without giving us a sou of it besides i'm like other men i'm anxious to be rich and enjoy myself i should like to ride in my carriage like other people do and whenever a gamin such as i was once opened the door for me i should put a five-franc piece in his hand he was interrupted by madame d'audelin the worthy housekeeper who rushed into the room without knocking in a terrible state of excitement monsieur she exclaimed in the same tone as if she would have called fire here is monsieur de valorcet monsieur fortunat sprang up and turned extremely pale what to the devil brings him here he anxiously stammered tell him that i've gone out tell him but it was useless for the marquis at that very moment entered the room and the agent could only dismiss his housekeeper and chupin monsieur de valorcet seemed to be very angry and it looked as if he meant to give vent to his passion indeed as soon as he was alone with m fortunat he began so this is the way you betray your friends master twenty per cent why did you deceive me last night about the ten thousand francs you had promised me why didn't you tell me the truth 
you knew of the misfortune that had befallen m de chalus i heard of it scarcely an hour ago through a letter from madame leon m fortunat hesitated somewhat he was a quiet man opposed to violence of any kind and it seemed to him that m de valorsay was twisting and turning his cane in a most ominous manner i must confess m le marquis he at last replied that i had not the courage to tell you of the dreadful misfortune which had befallen us how us certainly if you lose the hope of several millions i also lose the amount i advanced you forty thousand francs my entire fortune and yet you see that i don't complain do as i do confess that the game is lost the marquis was listening with an air of suppressed wrath his face was crimson there was a dark frown on his brow and his hands were clinched he was apparently furious with passion but in reality he was perfectly self-possessed the best proof that can be given of his coolness is that he was carefully studying m fortunat's face and trying to discover the agent's real intentions under his meaningless words he had expected to find his dear extortioner exasperated by his loss cursing and swearing and demanding his money but not at all he found him more gentle and calm colder and more reserved than ever brimful of resignation indeed and preaching submission to the inevitable what can this mean he thought with an anxious heart what mischief is the scoundrel plotting now i'd wager a thousand to one that he's forging some thunderbolt to crush me and in a haughty tone he said aloud in a word you desert me with a deprecatory gesture m fortunat exclaimed i desert you monsieur le marquis what have i done that you should think so ill of me alas circumstances are the only traitors i shouldn't like to deprive you of the courage you so much need but honestly it would be folly to struggle against destiny how can you hope to succeed in your plans have you not resorted to every possible expedient to prolong your apparently brilliant existence until the present time are you not at such a point that you must marry mademoiselle marguerite in a month's time or perish and now the count's millions are lost if i might be allowed to give you some advice i should say the shipwreck is inevitable think only of saving yourself by tact and shrewdness you might yet save something from your creditors compromise with them and if you need my services here i am go to nice and give me a power of attorney to act for you from the debris of your fortune i will undertake to guarantee you a competence which would satisfy many an ambitious man the marquis laughed sneeringly excellent he exclaimed you would rid yourself of me and recover your forty thousand francs at the same time a very clever arrangement m fortunat realized that his client understood him but what did it matter i assure you he began but the marquis silenced him with a contemptuous gesture let us stop this nonsense said he we understand each other better than that i have never made any attempt to deceive you nor have i ever supposed that i had succeeded in doing so and pray do me the honour to consider me as shrewd as yourself and still refusing to listen to the agent he continued if i have come to you it is only because the case is not so desperate as you suppose i still hold some valuable cards which you are ignorant of in your opinion and every one else's mademoiselle marguerite is ruined but i know that she is still worth three millions at the very least mademoiselle marguerite yes monsieur twenty per cent let her become my wife and the very next day i will place her in possession of an income of a hundred and fifty thousand francs but she must marry me first and this scornful maiden will not grant me her hand unless i can convince her of my love and disinterestedness but your rival m de valorsay gave a nervous start but quickly controlled himself he no longer exists read this day's figaro and you will be edified i have no rival now if i can only conceal my financial embarrassment a little longer she is mine a friendless and homeless girl cannot defend herself long in paris especially when she has an adviser like madame leon 
oh i shall win her i shall have her she is a necessity to me now you can judge if it would be wise on your part to deprive me of your assistance would you like to know what i want simply this the means to sustain me two or three months longer some thirty thousand francs you can procure the money will you it would make in all seventy thousand francs that i should owe you and i will promise to pay you two hundred and fifty thousand if i succeed and i shall succeed such profit is worth some risk reflect and decide but no more subterfuges if you please let your answer be plain yes or no without a second's hesitation m fortuna replied no the flush on the marquis's face deepened and his voice became a trifle harsher but that was all confess then that you have resolved to ruin me he said you refuse before you have heard me to the end wait at least until i have told you my plans and shown you the solid foundation which my hopes rest upon but m fortuna had resolved to listen to nothing he wished for no explanations so distrustful was he of himself so much did he fear that his adventurous nature would urge him to incur further risk he was positively afraid of the marquis de valorsay's eloquence besides he knew well enough that the person who consents to listen is at least half convinced tell me nothing monsieur he hastily answered it would be useless i haven't the money if i had given you ten thousand francs last night i should have been compelled to borrow them of m prosper berthomy and even if i had the money i should still say impossible every man has his system his theory you know mine is never to run after my money with me whatever i may lose i regard it as finally lost i think no more about it and turn to something else so your forty thousand francs have already been entered on my profit and loss account and yet it would be easy enough for you to repay me if you would follow my advice and go quietly into bankruptcy never interrupted m de valorsay never i do not wish to temporize he continued i will save all or save nothing if you refuse me your help i shall apply elsewhere i will never give my good friends who detest me and whom i cordially hate in return the delicious joy of seeing the marquis de valorsay fall step by step from the high position he has occupied i will never truckle to the men whom i have eclipsed for fifteen years no never i would rather die or even commit the greatest crime he suddenly checked himself a trifle astonished perhaps by his own plain speaking and for a moment he and m fortuna looked into each other's eyes striving to divine their respective secret thoughts the marquis was the first to speak and so said he in a tone which he strove to make persuasive but which was threatening instead it is settled your decision is final final you will not even condescend to listen to my explanation it would be a loss of time on receiving this cruel reply m de valorsay struck the desk such a formidable blow with his clenched fist that several bundles of papers fell to the floor his anger was not feigned now what are you plotting then he exclaimed and what do you intend to do what is your object in betraying me take care it is my life that i am going to defend and as truly as there is a god in heaven i shall defend it well a man who is determined to blow his brains out if he is defeated is a terribly dangerous adversary woe to you if i ever find you standing between me and the count de chalus's millions every drop of blood had fled from m fortuna's face still his mien was composed and dignified you do wrong to threaten me said he i don't fear you in the least if i were your enemy i should bring suit against you for the forty thousand francs you owe me i should not obtain my money of course but i could shatter the tottering edifice of your fortune by a single blow besides you forget that i possess a copy of our agreement signed by your own hand and that i have only to show it to mademoiselle marguerite to give her a just opinion of your disinterestedness let us sever our connection now monsieur and each go his own way without reference to the other if you should succeed you will repay me 
victory perched upon the agent's banner and it was with a feeling of pride that he saw his noble client depart white and speechless with rage what a rascal that marquis is he muttered i would certainly warn mademoiselle marguerite poor girl if i were not so much afraid of him End of chapter thirteen